Welcome to Maui Electric Vehicle Alliance, or Maui EVA for short. My name is Ann Ku. I'm the director of this one-year project. Our goal is to deliver a multi-year implementation plan to get Maui ready for electric vehicles. This one-hour show is aired eight times a month on this channel and also Channel 55 and also on Maui College's homepage. Previous episodes are available for download. In this third episode, I'd like to introduce Margaret Larson, Vehicle Specialist for Hawaii State Energy Office. She's going to give us an update on the current status of just how ready Hawaii is for electric vehicles. Hi there, my name is Margaret Larson. I work for the Hawaii State Energy Office within the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. Uh, my title is Vehicle Specialist and I work on clean transportation programs. And I'm here today to discuss our Hawaii Electric Vehicle Ready program and give you some updates as to where we are with electric vehicle deployment and adoption, as well as our, the state's partnership with the Maui Electric Vehicle Alliance per the Clean Cities uh, community Readiness for Electric Vehicles grant that we are collaborating on. Wanted to give some background in regards to where we're at with the way that we use our energy and our imported fossil fuels here in Hawaii. Uh, transportation does make up more than um, half of the way that we use fossil fuels. You can see on this slide that actually ground transportation is a third. Um, and so it's a significant component um, uh, part of how we use electricity here. Um, we have the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative um, that was started back in 2009 with a partnership with the Department of Energy. The goal is to transform Hawaii to a clean energy economy, 70% uh, clean energy by 2030. And the mix of that is 30% using energy efficiency and 40% renewable portfolio standard, <clears throat> which means 40% of the way that we use um, electricity would come and be generated from renewable sources such as wind, solar, etc. cetera. Uh, the Clean Energy Initiative will not only help us get off of oil and our addiction here in Hawaii, but also um, increase economic development, um, our energy and economic security, um, as well as uh, foster partnerships and build a uh, new workforce for the future of Hawaii. We can also serve as a clean energy model for the world. Um, in many ways, Hawaii is an incubator and a terrific test bed for clean energy projects um, due to the fact that we have a very wide um, uh, array of renewable energy uh, resources here in Hawaii. In terms of transportation and how that fits into the clean energy goals, we also have our 70%, a 70% goal um, to in transportation, which kind of feeds into the HCEI goals. Um, you won't be able to reach the overall 70% clean energy goals here in Hawaii without addressing transportation. Uh, right now, we use a, about 550 million gallons a year uh, of oil um, for our ground transportation, and we have a 70% reduction goal to get to about 385 million gallons a year by 2030. There's a couple ways that we're looking to address that, um, electric vehicles being one of them. Uh, and you can see here the mix of how we're going to get to the 70% uh, as well as how much million gallons a year of fuel um, it will be uh, using or, or reducing. Um, we're looking at renewable fuels um, such as biofuels, drop-in replacement fuels, um, as well as improving the efficiency of our overall fleet that which you could get through uh, federal cafe standards, the corporate average fuel economy, basically buying more efficient vehicles, um, hybrids as one, or just more efficient vehicles. Um, if you purchase a vehicle that's maybe five miles per gallon more efficient than what you're already driving, that would be contributing to that goal. Accelerating the deployment of electric vehicles and then also reducing the overall number of vehicle miles traveled. So basically getting out of your, co your car or carpooling, telecommuting, um, using mass transit, et cetera. Um, in terms of our electric vehicle targets, they are extremely aggressive and they are targets and not necessarily projections for the future. Um, 
the EV penetration levels for here in Hawaii, um, it's going to really depend on a variety of market forces, such as the vehicle price and the availability, um, the fuel price that we use, so that would be you know, our electricity prices, um, the availability of incentives, uh, as well as consumer behavior and preference um, as we really look to clearly consumers to purchase new, these new type of technology vehicles, as well as fleets. In terms of electric vehicles, kind of the, the, the strategic uh, pathways and the action items that we're going to look at how to really bring an electric vehicle um, market and industry here in Hawaii, um, developing a charging network, developing incentives, working with the automotive industry, and um, looking for different type of incentives and structuring for, for EVs. And I'll go more into that. Um, this basically shows you what type of renewable energy potential and demand that we have here on the islands. The great thing about electric vehicles is the battery. That's basically the, the, whole, the whole point of EVs, of EVs is the battery. Not only are they more efficient, but they also offer a way to store the renewable energy that we um, have an abundance of here in Hawaii. Um, the, the electric vehicle then turns into a great storage device. Um, so the curtailed wind that we have here on Maui, for instance, that you're not using at night could then go into your vehicle and you can use that wind and that clean energy into your vehicles. Um, the cool thing about EVs is that they get cleaner over time. Um, it's the only vehicle on the road that gets cleaner and greener um, as our grid gets cleaner and greener. Some transportation factoids. Um, we have about um, uh, just under a million vehicles here on the road, um, just overall across all types of different vehicles. Um, on average, Hawaii sells about 50,000 vehicles. We haven't quite been hitting those numbers more recently due to the recession. So we're at 35,000 uh, most recently. Um, 730 EVs, or there's a little bit more than that actually now, um, but probably by maybe 30 or so um, on the road here today, and about 11,000 or so, um, 11,400 whatnot hybrids, which don't have a plug, so that'd be kind of like your, um, your, hybrid, your hybrid Prius, for instance. Um, right now we are, Hawaii is the nation's leader on a per capita basis for public EV charging stations. Um, by August of this year, 2012, we'll have one charging station for every 5,000 residents. Um, and I'll get into that of how that all works out. EVs really make sense for Hawaii because um, we have the potential be, to become an international showcase. Uh, we have the synergies with the tourism industry. Uh, we also have uh, limited driving distances because we're an island. We also have slower speeds, um, which the battery, you don't suck up as much energy. Uh, we also have a warm climate, which the batteries like, um, and the state has been um, working uh, very hard to get some favorable policies for electric vehicles. Um, of course, with every opportunity, there are challenges, um, which is basically the cost associated, public out education outreach, as well as how long the vehicle fleet is in terms of, you know, if you buy a car today, you're probably gonna have that car for 15 years. So we're really looking at a certain demographic within those who are uh, looking to buy new vehicles in any case. Um, this isn't the first time that we uh, have been doing electric vehicles in Hawaii. Actually, the very first vehicle that came to Hawaii back in um, the late 1800s was an, was an electric vehicle. Uh, and uh, clearly, you know, those got kind of um, bought out by the internal combustion engine and the gasoline. But then again, in the late uh, uh, 1990s, the electric vehicle made its uh, comeback, uh, so to speak, in the um, U.S. Uh, you know, marketplace. And back then, even Hawaii realized that EVs make sense for those same reasons. Um, we did, um, the state proclaimed uh, electric vehicle day on November 14th. We also have the Hawaii Center for um, Appropriate Transportation Technologies, Advanced Transportation Technologies, um, who actually put in quite a lot of fast charging stations um, and really was looking to make Hawaii EV ready back then. They were very progressive as well um, by putting policy in place that would give EVs special license plates to get free parking and use of the HOV lane with a single passenger. That legislation, that law, we still have today thanks to the efforts that they did back in the 1990s. Um, today, um, which I guess would be the third comeback of the electric vehicle and one that we're hoping to really stick, um, back in the 90s, industry-wide across the market, um, the EV just really wasn't the right timing. There's a 
quite a few different uh, reasons and conspiracy theories out there of why the industry didn't work. But in any case, um, here we are again. I think this this time around, it, I think it really will work. Um, the federal government um, put together their stimulus program, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Some of those fundings went into state energy programs nationwide. Within our state energy program here in Hawaii, we allocated about $5 million towards um, EV readiness, and we separated that $5 million um, in three different ways, one towards EV rebates, another towards grants for specific projects and companies, and also um, use some funding for our state motor pool um, to get electric vehicles within our fleet, as well as put in some charging stations in public lots. In terms of the grant program, it was a competitive process, and six organizations were chosen. Um, they also put in some cost share. You can see some of the details on this slide, but the companies that were chosen were Better Place and Aero Environment. They are two different companies who are offer charge, um, charging stations or charging stations management, um, and they're putting charging stations across the state. Um, we're looking at about 200 charging locations across this whole grant program. Um, and you can see kind of how the allocation worked out there. Uh, Green Car Hawaii is a car sharing program kind of similar to Zipcar, which is on the mainland. But basically, they're working closely with the hospitality industry and with hotels to, um, if you're a tourist or, or if you're a local, um, you could rent the vehicle out, an EV, out for just like an hour or however long you want. So you're not tied to the vehicle for all day long. Um, it's a great way to uh, get electric vehicles into the marketplace where our community members um, and you know the public can go and try an EV as well as tourists can cruise around for however long that they want. Uh, Plug in America is a nonprofit. They received grant funding to do a electric vehicle uh, charging station guidebook of how to install the, the chargers and all the, the different steps that you need to consider um, for commercial properties. Uh, City and County of Honolulu, as well as the County of Kauai, received funding to get electric vehicles within their, within their fleet, as well as putting in charging stations. This map shows how the EV Ready program, um, the chargers that were funded under that program, how they're dispersed. Um, there are more chargers to date on um, this map because not all the chargers that are here in Hawaii were funded under the program. There are a lot of other companies who have a presence here in Hawaii um, that were not part of the grant program. Uh, we do have a full list of where the chargers are um, on the state energy website, electricvehicle.hawaii.gov. That's our um, EV website that we have on the state um, energy site. And within that, there's the EV charging station location database. Um, we do update as frequently as we can um, as we hear about new um, public chargers that go up. If you have a public charger and you would like for it to appear on this list, please uh, go to the website and contact us and we'll um, be uh, make sure to put it on there. Um, there are quite a lot of key partners within um, within this new EV industry and a rollout of electric vehicles and deployment. Um, charging companies are one. There's a list there. EV automakers. We have an agreement with both Nissan and Mitsubishi um, to work on developing the EV marketplace here in Hawaii. Other stakeholders um, include our utilities, our counties, our universities, um, our tourism uh, industry and the hospitality industry, um, parking lot owners, et cetera. You can see the list there. Um, this is kind of a cluttered slide, but I, I wanted just to get the point across that there is a lot of progressive EV policy going on in the state. Um, I mentioned the policy that was passed back in the 90s that gave uh, license plates for electric vehicles and gave free parking. Um, we that law still is in effect. Um, I'm talking to you on May. No, no. What is today? April 26th. Um, hopefully that that doesn't date this uh, this video. But in any case, um, the point is that we're still in legislative session. May 3rd is the end of the 2012 legislative session, and there are a couple bills that are in session that affect some of the EV policies that might change the laws. Um, for instance, the uh, policy that gives free parking, um, which right now is Act 290, there's a set Senate Bill 2746 that, if passed, would um, still allow EV, free EV parking, but would put a little bit of time constraints on there. Um, and we uh, redefined the definition of electric vehicle to ensure that it included plug-in hybrids, for instance, the new plug-in Prius, as well as the Chevy Volt. 
Um, the other policy that was um, passed that was very progressive into getting our electric vehicle market here in Hawaii was Act 156, and that was from 2009. Um, that's the legislation that calls for uh, electric vehicle parking stalls and charging stations at large parking facilities that have um, public parking. So if you're a, a lot that has over 100 stalls where the public can park, um, then you'll need to set aside a certain amount of stalls. The law as is today says 1% um, stalls that you need, you would need to set aside 1% of those stalls and then put in um, a charger in one of those. Uh, there is a bill um, that looks like it is going to the governor, so I am expecting for that to actually pass, and that would amend some of the um, some of the legislation that was passed in 2009. So that's Senate Bill 2747. The changes that would be made is basically instead of the 1%, um, which uh, I don't have a, a whole lot of time to go into the, the details of, of um, how the 1% works, but in any case, instead of the 1%, we're just going to be doing one stall. So if you have a parking lot with over 100 stalls that are available to the public, you'll be required to put in uh, one stall for electric vehicles, and that stall will need to have um, some sort of charging cap uh, capacity capability. Um, the legislation also um, just clarified uh, a couple of housekeeping items in terms of language. Um, so be sure to take a look at that. Um, you can go to capital.hawaii.gov to get more information on both of those bills. Um, a bill that wasn't touched this year in legislative session um, was HRS 196 7.5, uh, which basically um, addresses multifamily housing dwellings like apartments and condos. So if you live in an apartment or condo and you have an electric vehicle, this law basically um, protects you in a sense, from the homeowners association from denying you. So if you want to get a charger and you live in a condo, um, your homeowners association cannot deny you from having it. Now, it doesn't necessarily say who their ownership is going to be in terms of who's going to pay for it. So there might be a little bit of negotiations that will need to occur. But um, the bill was progressive in the sense of um, kind of taking the lead on how to address the condo issue, which there is an issue in terms of having to get charging stations in condos because it does is a little bit tricky. Um, Hawaii was very progressive in that legislation. Actually, California modeled a lot of the work that we did here in Hawaii um, in, in their own law. Um, this just goes into the definition of electric vehicle uh, of how we have it now. Um, which basically ties it to a battery storage capacity. Um, so it will allow for plug-in hybrids. Um, there's been a lot to date that we've done to um, bring electric vehicles here to Hawaii, um, to bring the market here and to continue it. Um, we're, we're not nearly done, um, but there's been a lot of partnerships and a lot of great work. Uh, the EV Ready program with the grants and the rebates. Uh, we have time of use rates um, that HECO has as well as here in, in Maui with MECO. Um, basically a lower rate if you have an electric vehicle. Um, during a certain amount of times during the day. Uh, we have electric vehicles with the, we have the Nissan Leaf. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, we have the Nissan Leaf, um, the Mitsubishi i, Chevy Volt, WeGo, and Toyota plug-in Prius. Um, so those are all actually really exciting that we are a launch market for many of those vehicles here in Hawaii. Um, looking to get electric vehicles in our rental car fleets. That's a very um, significant part of where the vehicles are today and that's actually a really um, important piece um, of this puzzle. Enterprise is leading the way right now, Enterprise Rental Car on um, Oahu. They do have a fleet of about 20 or 30. Um, I think they are looking to bring them here to Maui. And then Green Car, which I mentioned. Uh, we, City and County of Honolulu has online permits for residential installs. So uh, if you're a homeowner, you can just pull your permit online. Um, I mentioned the progressive EV legislation. There is an, um, a progressive partnership that we have also with um, Japan um, and here in Maui, um, a really great project going on, which is a smart grid project that calls for a um, quite a lot of electric vehicles, which then would help with battery storage. Um, and uh, this grant, which I'm here today to work on, um, which is with the Clean Cities program out of the Department of Energy, which is an electric vehicle implementation planning grant. So uh, the State Energy Office is working collaboratively with UH Maui College, um, as well as Honolulu Clean Cities, as well as UC San Diego. Um, I'm not going to go into too much details in regards to the economics um, that I have up here of, of the 
um, how does your EV compare to your internal combustion engine. But a really great website that I like to recommend going to is uh, fueleconomy.gov as a really great cost calculator on there and a cost comparison where you can pull up your vehicle as well as a vehicle you're looking to purchase, whether it be an EV or, or any other type of vehicle for that matter. Um, on the EV side, then if you go to the cost comparison, there's actually, if you look at the fine print on the bottom, you can um, put in your own specifications. So you can put in your own gas prices, but you can also put in your own kilowatt uh, prices, which is really um, kind of great for us here in Hawaii because our, our averages, as you know, um, aren't always the same as the mainland. Um, so it's nice to put in um, the numbers that we have here in Hawaii to get kind of real-time numbers. Um, this is a number, for, these are some uh, data for the Volt. I had one for the Nissan Leaf before. In terms of, um, this question comes up a lot of how long can I, or how far can I drive if I plug into a level two charger? Um, the level two charger is a 240 volt, similar to your dryer outlet. If you have a full battery electric vehicle, such as the Nissan Leaf, and you plug into one of those, I have the calculations on there a bit, but you get about 10 miles an hour. Um, so there's three levels of charging that's out there. There's your level one, um, which is basically your, just your wall outlet that you have. Um, that's a slower charge. Then you have your next stage, which is your level two, which is the 240 volt. Um, it can charge your vehicle overnight, six to eight hours or so, um, depending on the type of vehicle you have. If you have a plug-in hybrid that ha you have some gas and a smaller battery, it'll take less time. Um, and then you have actually a level three or a fast charger that's, um, that's out there um, that actually Hawaii is looking to facilitate the um, installation of some fast chargers here on Maui as well as Oahu. Um, and that's a very quick charge that could charge your vehicle in 20 to 30 minutes. Um, in terms of what Ho State of Hawaii and the Energy Office um, is working on with Maui Electric Vehicle License and our subaward, um, we are um, participating in a couple ways. Um, one of which is we're working on um, a report that will be shared with Maui um, that will basically study the course of actions, the lessons learned, and all the steps and strategies that we've taken in the Energy Office as well as other stakeholders across Hawaii have taken towards EV um, adoption and charger deployment installation. Uh, and the re report will provide implementation strategies um, to guide the development of an EV market in Hawaii. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and uh, look forward to seeing you on the road in your electric vehicle. So that was Margaret Larson from the State Energy Office in Honolulu. Please stay tuned and we'll be right back for the second presentation and that's California Dreamin'. Kenana mai ne o ko yamuse TV kapunai vele kiwi o kikula nui o Maui. The Bachelor of Applied Science and Engineering Technology at UH Maui College provides curriculum and training in electronics, computers, optics, remote sensing, and other technologies. Always messed with video games and televisions and computers, so it was always something I really wanted to work with, you know, throughout my life. I always had a fascination with electronics, and then because I was in the associate's degree, that also, like, motivated me to do the bachelor's degree. This degree prepares graduates to be productive professionals who can make meaningful contributions to industry in Maui County, the state of Hawaii, and the world. Well, I especially like the hands-on experience that we get and the hands-on learning that we receive. You don't need to leave home to do it. For me, it means that it's affordable. I can stay here on Maui. If you would like more information on how to apply to this program, call the Educational Opportunity Center at 984-3286 or visit us online at maui.hawaii.edu. Welcome back to Maui Eva. My name is Ann Koo, and we just heard Margaret Larson, vehicle specialist of our Hawaii State Energy Office, give us an update on the latest on EV readiness for the state. 
Next, I'd like to introduce two speakers that we invited for our plug-in Maui Challenges and Opportunities One Day Conference at the end of April. Margaret also spoke there, and in the next episode are more speakers from that conference. Our two speakers are Mike Ferry and David Almeida, both from the California Center for Sustainable Energy. Mike Ferry is also the Clean Cities Coordinator for San Diego. Mike manages over $12 million in federal California state and San Diego regional programs. And both Mike and David have helped us greatly in our effort to get Maui ready for EVs. In their presentation, you'll hear about their recent survey of drivers of EVs and what they found out, which is the first large survey of its kind in the world. Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Ferry. I'm the Transportation Programs Manager at the California Center for Sustainable Energy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, today I'm going to talk about plug-in electric vehicles uh, in the California market. Um, we really have had one full year of market, of a mature market uh, deployment of EVs uh, so far in California, just over a year. But we're incredibly excited about what we've accomplished so far and uh, today I'm going to share um, with you what the market looks like in California, uh, what uh, drivers are doing, and where we're headed next. So first I'd like to just introduce the company I work for. Uh, I'm with the California Center for Sustainable Energy. We're a nonprofit located in San Diego. We have just over 80 employees. We've been around for about 15 years, and we have three main areas of focus. Renewable energy, clean transportation, and green building and energy efficiency. And we work in these fields through a variety of programs and different mechanisms. Um, we administer programs for uh, the state government and local governments. We're involved in research and analysis in the energy field. Uh, we provide policy support for uh, regulators and legislatures in the state of California. And a lot of what we do is marketing, education, and outreach to consumers all over San, uh, San Diego and all over California. And uh, you can see a lot of the partners we work with, a lot of local partners, a lot of uh, regional and statewide and even federal partners. And you can see some of the programs we're involved with, um, vehicle rebates, uh, the California Solar Initiative, uh, United States Department of Energy, Clean Cities, and a lot of other programs that we, uh, that we work through. A little bit about our transportation programs at the Center for Sustainable Energy. So the, our core competency at uh, the center in terms of transportation uh, is electrification uh, of the transportation sector, plug-in vehicles. But we also have programs that involve other alternative fuels like compressed natural gas, uh, propane, and we're also involved uh, in some advanced research uh, such as our uh, battery research project with uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory where we're looking at uh, the second use of electric vehicle batteries, uh, so post-vehicle use of these batteries in stationary energy storage applications. So let's go to some numbers here. So I mentioned the market for electric vehicles in California uh, has really hit maturity in the last year. And between January of 2011 and today, uh, we have about 9,000 plug-in electric vehicles on the road in California. These are uh, not low-speed vehicles, these are not toys, these are full-function, high-performance uh, consumer vehicles. And the majority of these 9,000 vehicles that are on the roads right now in California um, are comprised of these two vehicles here, the Nissan LEAF and the Chevy Volt. Nissan LEAF being a pure battery electric vehicle, no gasoline, just uh, electric propulsion and the Chevy Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid. It's a plug-in vehicle, an electric vehicle, and also um, has a gasoline engine to provide extended range. So let's talk about electric vehicles in sort of a big perspective. So there are lots of electric vehicles out there, lots of that are coming to market. Every major automobile manufacturer around the world either has a full production EV that's been deployed to the market, or they have pre-production vehicles or demonstration vehicles. Um, going forward, three to four years, every major OEM around the world will have a 
plug-in vehicle, whether a pure battery or a plug-in hybrid vehicle, a plug-in vehicle, full production. Uh, so it's very exciting. We're at the, still in the early stages, but uh, the future is just incredibly bright. Today, uh, when we talk about market deployment of electric vehicles, we're really talking about these four, the Nissan LEAF, the Chevy Volt, and then these two other vehicles, the Mitsubishi iMeV, which is again, a, a, like the LEAF, a pure battery electric, and the plug-in version of the very popular Toyota Prius, uh, which just came on the market about uh, two months ago. But these four vehicles make up the vast majority of the market around the world. And what's that market look like? Well, there are about 62,000 plug-in vehicles, again, full function plug-in vehicles um, on the roads around the world, um, primarily in Japan, North America, and some in Europe. And you can see the numbers here, about 30,000 Leafs deployed around the world, uh, 18,000 iMeVs, those mostly in Japan, some in Europe, some in North America, 12,000 volts, uh, almost all here in North America. There's a sister vehicle to the Volt uh, that will be uh, brought to the European market uh, later this year. And then the plug-in version of the Prius, which we call the Prius PHV for plug-in hybrid vehicle. There are about 2,000 of those uh, on the roads now, uh, and again, that car has only been available for about two months, and we expect by the end of the year uh, for there to be about 40 to 45,000 Prius PHEVs on the road. So, uh, big growth in the market around the world. Here in the U.S., about 25,000 plug-ins on the road, um, and most, well, not most, but just about 40% of those uh, vehicles um, are here in Cal, are not here in California, are in California. We're in Hawaii. Um, so again, about 9,000 plug-in vehicles on the roads in California, and here's the break out, breakdown. Um, 4,600 Leafs, about 2,800 volts, 800 of the Prius, uh, and again, that's only after two months, so we expect maybe four to 5,000 Prius by the end of the year, and maybe 15,000 uh, 15 to 20,000 plug-ins on the road uh, by the end of 2012. So we're still in the early stages of the market, but it's been a tremendous year uh, for plug-ins and for plug-ins in California. In terms of the infrastructure uh, to support those vehicles, this is both residential charging stations and public charging stations. We have about a thousand public charge points uh, around the state at this point and about 5,500 residential level two chargers. So these are specialized charging units that operate at 240 volts, which are very important for a vehicle like the Nissan LEAF, which has a big battery. And uh, although you can plug that car into a standard 120 volt outlet, because of the size of the battery, you want something that's more robust that can charge the battery uh, faster, um, that's much more useful. Most of this infrastructure in California has uh, been subsidized through both federal and state programs, which has helped build the market and help grow the market. Uh, by the end of the year, again, we'll probably have double the number of public charging stations. We'll probably have another few thousand of the residential chargers. And just in this last month, uh, we've seen the first fast charging uh, public chargers uh, that have been deployed. These are uh, 480 volt uh, DC fast charging units that can charge a Nissan LEAF in 20 to 25 minutes. Um, by the end of the year, we'll have probably a few dozen of those around the state, which again is just infrastructure that makes this market more viable and more exciting. So why is California a leader in plug-in vehicles? Um, why did all the auto, automobile manufacturers choose California as a launch market. It really goes back to over 50 years of policy in California that promotes clean uh, vehicles. And the motivation behind that has to do historically with air quality. Uh, California has um, been an area in the country that has had the most challenges with urban air quality. Even today, um, of the 10 most polluted cities in the United States, Eight of those 10 are in California for um, ozone pollution, and six out of 10 for uh, pollution from particulate matter. So air quality is a big driver towards um, bringing clean vehicles and promoting, subsidizing clean vehicles and creating a regulatory uh, environment that makes clean vehicle adoption um, better in California. But today there are other motivations besides uh, just clean air. Um, California has made a tremendous, a big commitment to 
towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions across the state from every sector, industrial sector, uh, transportation, uh, buildings. And as you can see here, in terms of the statewide greenhouse gas emissions, 36% of California's emissions come from the transportation sector. And about two thirds of those emissions come from the light duty vehicle sector. Uh, so those are cars and trucks that we drive every day. So when the state is looking at how do we meet our commitments for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, transportation is something that has to be tackled head on. And plug-in vehicles offer a technology and um, a capability to reduce significantly greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector. California also has policies uh, that have to do with energy use and petroleum reduction. So we want to reduce the amount of petroleum that we import into the state, the amount of petroleum we consume. At the same time, we want to increase the amount of renewable energy that the state is using. Right now, uh, California has a 20% a renewables portfolio standard, meaning that for every kilowatt hour that's consumed in California, 20% has to be generated from renewable sources uh, like solar, uh, wind, and biomass. By 2020, that 20% will be increased to 33%, which means that our plug-in vehicles that we're putting on the road today are going to get cleaner as time goes on. Plug-in vehicles, unlike gas vehicles, um, actually get cleaner the longer that they're on the road because they get cleaner as the grid gets cleaner. And California, uh, again, is committed to a cleaner grid. And not just in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but in terms of pollutant emissions as well. So one of the big policy in place today that promotes electric vehicles in California and, and gets these vehicles into consumers' hands and um, and helps consumers make the purchase decision to, uh, to buy a plug-in vehicle is the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project. This is California's statewide rebate program for plug-in vehicles. And this is a program that the California Center for Sustainable Energy uh, manages and administers uh, on behalf of the state throughout California. And to talk about the rebate project, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague here, David Almeida. Well, thanks everybody for uh, having us here. Um, uh, my name is David Almeida. I am the uh, Plug-in Electric Vehicle Program Manager at the California Center for Sustainable Energy. Um, and we're really excited here uh, to be here today to, uh, to talk about some of the work that we've done in California. So I'm specifically going to talk about the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project and uh, um, also about uh, um, the planning work that we've been uh, doing for the past couple of years. But uh, let me start off with the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project. As Mike had mentioned, it is the primary vehicle incentive program uh, throughout the state of California. It's funded directly from the state through the California Air Resources Board but it is funded indirectly through California residences through or residents through increases in vehicle and uh, um, smog abatement fees. So the idea here is they are increasing the fees that cr um, create the pollution to find solutions to reduce that pollution. So it's a, um, it's a very uh, exciting uh, project and uh, we're very proud of it. Um, over the past three years, the funding has steadily increased. As you can see, when we started the project in 2009, we had $4.1 million uh, in incentive funding. Um, if we flash uh, forward to what we have today, we've got uh, $15 million uh, in, the pro in the project um, from this past year. Um, next year, we're expecting that this uh, amount is only going to um, increase. Be and the reason why the money has increased so dramatically is because the number of vehicles that are on the um, market in California has steadily increased because consumers are adopting these uh, vehicles um, in a, at a much more rapid pace than uh, we initially had uh, um, uh, thought. So um, while the, the incentive, the, um, the rebate is a um, a very uh, good use of an incentive that can offset the incremental cost of that vehicle, so it helps to offset that increased cost. Uh, we realize that um, when, you're, uh, when you're going into this decision as a vehicle purchaser, you're also facing a very steep learning curve. And so in addition to providing a rebate check to um, help uh, offset that cost, we also have a, a very robust uh, um, consumer education program that we've implemented across the state of California. 
Over the past three years, we've reached close to 30,000 consumers. And in each one of these uh, um, events that we've held across the state, we bring in the key stakeholders that are involved in that uh, decision once a uh, consumer decides that they want to um, purchase an electric vehicle. So, um, so who are these people? Some of these people are the utilities. The utilities are there to um, talk about low access to uh, um, low cost fueling through time of use rates. We also bring in electrical contractors as well as electric vehicle service providers, so those um, organizations that are providing the charging equipment to help walk consumers through that uh, um, decision of getting a charging station, getting installed in their house, and uh, um, navigating through all of the, um, that, that process. We also bring in municipalities to talk about um, how they can help consumers walk through some of the, um, the uh, permitting steps or some of the other regulations that they may not have ex ever experienced because they've never done this sort of thing. They've never installed a charging station at their, at their um, residence. Because it's a, it's a big shift from moving from fueling at the gas station or at a gas pump to now fueling at home. So we realize that it's a steep learning curve, but we want to bring all of those key actors together so that we can uh, um, help uh, um, reduce that barrier, and that barrier being the lack of information or lack of education. So in addition to the work that we've done related towards vehicle incentives, we've also been uh, um, involved in infrastructure funding, or I'm sorry, in infrastructure planning uh, throughout uh, on the state uh, for the past few years. So I think we're all here today because uh, we're funded through a grant from the Department of Energy um, that is looking at making communities more PEV ready. Well, in California, each of these areas that is on the screen have also received that grant. So we're doing um, uh, many of the same things that um, you guys are doing here in Maui and identifying some of these challenges and barriers to infrastructure deployment and finding solutions to those. What's a little unique in California is the fact that the state has identified that there that this is a big problem, that this is a big issue that we need to um, continue to address beyond the scope of the Department of Energy funding. And as a result, the Energy Commission, the California Energy Commission, has uh, invested funding to extend the life of the, um, the work that we're doing, um, funded from the Department of Energy, for another two years. Because they, again, they identify that these challenges and these barriers are things that we need to work through on continually because because we're not going to find a solution in, um, in just nine months. It's going to take a much longer time to do that. So what am I talking about by challenges? Well, some of the things that we've learned on the San Diego level is that uh, um, even after having 600 residential charging stations um, installed in homes across San Diego County, uh, we still have problems with permitting. Um, we have that on the residential side, but we have even more challenges when we're talking about public infrastructure. Uh, so this is a huge barrier to um, PEV infrastructure deployment. Building codes, looking forward where we want to um, make sure that we can install uh, conduit or we can install the infrastructure that will promote uh, um, the charging stations into the future. Well, we do that by writing building codes today that will speak for buildings for tomorrow. Um, we also identified that Public infrastructure is only going to fit one piece of the pie. We also need to look at workplace charging and identify ways that we can increase that um, uh, in various different workplaces within our region. One of the things that Mike is going to talk about in a little bit more detail is the real gap between vehicle owners um, in multi-unit dwellings or in multi-family residences compared to those that are in a single-family residence, those people that own their homes. So we've already identified that in this first year that the majority of consumers are not homeowners. They're not living in a single family residence um, building. So how do, we, how do we increase vehicle adoption with, multi -unit, with people that live in multi-unit dwellings? Well, one of the ways that we do that is get them better access to infrastructure. So I just wanted to highlight the fact that while we're working on a state level with various different regions, on the local level, we're working with a series of stakeholders to address some of these challenges that we talked about, like permitting or like building codes. And we realize that the folks that we're working on the regional level have this experience. They bring that, uh, that, that experience to the table to find solutions to these barriers. And so it's a very important aspect. So while we're working with state policymakers. We're also working on the local level with people that are, are facing these issues and challenges um, on the ground. 
So um, I'm going to pass this off to Mike. He's going to tell you a little bit more about a survey that we have implemented uh, um, to PEV drivers throughout the state of California. All right, thank you, David. So now I'm going to talk about who are the people driving uh, these plug-in vehicles. This is a map that we created uh, that shows the distribution of electric vehicle ownership around California. Um, on the left, you see a statewide map, and the dark green areas represent counties with a high penetration of electric vehicle adoption. And no surprise here, uh, the, the electric vehicles are concentrated in the major urban areas along the coast, the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Los Angeles, Orange County, and San Diego. On the right is a, a map that shows where the electric vehicles are within those primary urban areas. Um, this is on a zip code level. And as you can see, there are definitely areas of high penetration. And this is something that, um, that we expected, but uh, here's data that shows exactly where these cars uh, are going. So let's talk about, let's talk about the, the drivers of the vehicles. So we, uh, beginning um, earlier this year, uh, we put together and executed what we think is the largest plug-in electric vehicle owner survey uh, in history. Um, we put together a survey and sent it to uh, tw over 2,500 California plug-in electric vehicle owners. We received almost 1,400 uh, respondents uh, from the survey, which is a very high uh, rate of response for, for any survey that goes out. The survey was sent to EV owners who've uh, owned their car for six months or longer. And this is the first of many surveys that we'll be uh, sending out over the next few years. Our plan is to continue surveying at six month intervals. As new owners uh, come into the state, they'll be uh, receiving uh, the survey. And we'll be going back to owners that received the survey in the, in the earlier rounds to find out how their perceptions have changed, how their driving behavior, charging behavior has changed, and how their satisfaction has changed, and what their perceptions of public infrastructure, their use of public infrastructure has changed. So we'll start with some of the results of the survey, um, and we'll look at the demographics. So we have a, what we've discovered is we have a very narrowly defined demographic here. 93% uh, of electric vehicle owners live in households of two or more people. 97% of EV owners in California own their own home. Uh, it's incredibly high. Um, in San Diego, for instance, over half of the population live in multi-unit dwellings, so they're not single-family homeowners. Um, but this demographic, 97% own their own home. 46% of households have incomes of $150,000 or more. So very uh, upper income uh, type of demographic. Over two thirds of the primary drivers are male and about half of the primary drivers have uh, postgraduate degrees. So again, when we look at the early adopters for these vehicles, we have this very telling, very you know, defined demographic. So how do the owners like their vehicles? Uh, well, it turns out they like them a lot. So when they rated their vehicles, uh, their plug-in vehicles on usefulness, reliability, and cost of service, over 90% rated all of those three categories as either good or excellent. And as you can see, for reliability and cost of service, over 80% was the highest rating, um, which is an excellent rating. And this bodes very well for the future of this uh, plug-in vehicle market because the early adopters are having great experiences with their cars. Um, so as we attempt to build the market, this is you know, data we can share and we can show how uh, these vehicles can meet the needs of a much wider array of consumers. How are EV owners uh, driving their cars? Well, they're driving them very similar to the rest of Californians. So the average Californian drives their vehicle about 1,000 miles per month. Uh, what we see here, uh, Chevrolet Volt owners are driving their cars about 866 miles a month. The Nissan Leaf owners, a little bit less, 766 miles a month. And this could be due, uh, the lower numbers could be due to the fact that this demographic has shorter commutes or different driving patterns. But the takeaway message from this is that these vehicles are being used as primary vehicles, as full-time vehicles. They're meeting the needs of their owners. 
Now, how often are electric vehicle owners uh, charging up? Uh, so this data comes to us from uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, which, which is the utility in the San Diego area. And they looked at residential charging behavior. So this is um, charging taking place at uh, a person's, uh, an owner's residence. And it turns out that people are, 90% uh, of owners are charging once or less per day. So what this tells us is that Fueling your electric vehicle is something that is incredibly convenient. You're fueling your car at home, you're waking up every morning with a full tank, so to speak, and you're not having to plug in all the time. You're plugging in once or maybe less than once per day. So it, it, it speaks to the, um, the practicality of these vehicles. Now, when are PEVs charging? When are plug-in electric vehicles charging? This is something uh, that's actually very important. So when are people allowing their vehicles to charge? Are they charging their vehicles during the day, um, when they get home from work? So one of the challenges of this market in the long run is efficiently integrating these vehicles into the electrical grid, the electricity grid. Um, California has a robust grid, but at certain times that grid is stressed, such as a hot summer afternoon uh, when everyone's running their air conditioning. So utilities realize that they can incorporate, they can integrate uh, large numbers of electric vehicles, which represents a significant new load on the electricity grid. They can integrate a large number of these vehicles onto the grid as long as the vehicles charge at a time when the grid isn't stressed, at, at a time when there's plenty of transmission capacity and at times when there's plenty of generation capacity, which in California means in the middle of the night, from midnight to 5 a.m. So again, this data is from San Diego Gas and Electric, and within that service territory, the utility has implemented a program to incentivize people to charge their cars from midnight to 5 a.m. They do that by giving them access to lower cost electricity during those hours. So if you charge your car in the middle of the day, you're gonna pay more. If you charge your car in the middle of the night, you're gonna pay less. And what's especially telling about this graph is that the charging uh, that you see on the left-hand side of the graph, the big uptick when all the cars start charging, doesn't happen at six, and six o'clock in the evening when people get home. It happens at midnight, which, which basically says that people understand the pricing signal and they're um, programming their vehicles so that the vehicles don't start charging till midnight. So owners aren't getting out of bed at midnight and going and plugging in their cars. They get home from work, they plug the car in, but they've programmed the car not to start charging till midnight. And owners are doing this, and we have now data that shows that owners are doing this, and it's a win for everybody. It's a win for the consumer because the consumer is getting access to lower cost electricity. It's a win for the utility because the utility is getting this new load at the exact time when they can uh, provide the electricity for this new load. And it's a win for the environment uh, because in California, when we use more kilowatt hours, when we use more electricity, the generation comes from natural gas power plants. The natural gas power plants that are operate in the middle of the night are much cleaner, are much more efficient than natural gas power plants that have to come on during the day and meet those peak loads. So this is exactly what we want to see. Um, this is what it's going to take to integrate not just 9,000 vehicles, but a million vehicles uh, onto California's electricity grid. And again, it's a win for everybody. And so this is incredible data that we have here that shows when these vehicles are charging between midnight and roughly 5 a.m. One of the relationships that uh, we somewhat expected to see, but now we have data to, sh to really show it, is this relationship between plug-in electric vehicle adoption or owners and solar PV ownership. So what we've found out is that statewide, and this is based on 1,396 respondents, a full 39% of those EV owners also have residential solar systems. So what we learn here is that who are the early adopters? Well, the early adopters are people who are energy savvy, 
are people who've already invested in an energy technology, like a solar system on their roof. And they know about these vehicles, they know what the benefits of these vehicles are, and they want to make a lifestyle choice, a consumer choice, a financial choice, um, to purchase now another technology, another energy technology that, um, that will allow them to achieve whatever goals they want, whether those are cost goals, lower cost fueling, whether those are environmental goals, reducing their own carbon footprint, um, what have you. So this is a very exciting relationship, and this relationship holds throughout the state of California. So we actually have data that plots solar adoption and PEV adoption, and it's a very tight relationship. So just to summarize, uh, again, we're very excited about the past year in California and how this market has gone from zero to 100 miles an hour you know, in, in just over a year. Um, but this is just the beginning. Uh, we have 9,000 vehicles on the road. By the end of the year, we may have 15,000. But when we look ahead, we want millions of vehicles on the road. So we have to move beyond these early adopters. We have to take the lessons that we've learned so far and figure out how do we keep momentum going and how do we bridge the gap to the next much broader segment of consumers. Some of the things that we know we need to do that, we need to have coordinated policies on the state and federal level. Those are critical to the expansion of this market. Uh, we have a well-defined uh, early adopter demographic. We know that they're energy and environmentally savvy and this, this is a group that we can take those lessons moving forward. We know that for early adopters, uh, for owners, they report a very high rate of vehicle util utilization and satisfaction. Again, this bodes well for the future, for growing this market. And finally, getting back to how we integrate these vehicles into the electricity grid, we know that the correct utility rate design, incentivizing people when to charge their cars, is vital to achieving beneficial charging behavior and to manage the load of these uh, the new load of these electric vehicles on the grid. And that's it. Thank you very much. So what was most amazing from that presentation, I think, is how the utility incentivized EV drivers to charge their cars at specific times so that it would use the otherwise oversupply of energy at low demands, in other words, late at night. Now here in Maui, we have wind, which is roaring after midnight or in the early hours when everyone's asleep and not using as much electricity as, say, during the daytime. How can we incentivize our EV owners to charge at those times? From the Maui EVA conference, the Plug-in Maui Challenges and Opportunities Conference. We heard a lot of speakers, and what we like to do is for the next episode, the fourth episode, which is next month, share with you four presenters talking about UCSD fleet, tailpipe endgame, the Mitsubishi iMeave, which is not here yet, and also Honolulu Clean Cities interviews and surveys of early adopters of charging stations in Oahu. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. watching MCTV, the UH Maui College Television Network.
나내 약속. 